and Squire Parsons. You can't get any better than that. My wife will have that song. She says, if you can't preach after that, your wood's wet. So <laughs> let me invite us to open our Bibles to Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to look at two brief verses, but I believe we could literally spend about four hours. I'm going to try to cut it to two. <laughs> and these brief uh, moments that we have, I pray that it will be a blessing to us all. We're going to be looking at a subject, running to win, running to win. And I believe it's a good title, a good text in relationship to where we are, especially in the culture, in relationship to the election campaigns that's taking place, not only from the president's standpoint, but across the nation with the different primaries. Uh, and uh, as we look at it, we think about running to win. We've got candidates that are running to win, but the candidates that are running to win in the primary and in the uh, general races that's being brought up and to be voted on on November the 3rd is nothing in comparison to the race that we're in, the race that we're in as Christians. And may I remind us, uh, there's some of us that might recall some of those days back in high school. I never participated in the athletic program. I was too interested in cutting out of class by noontime at lunchtime, thumbing a ride to the closest place where I would be working uh, to be involved in working. But I know a lot of those that participated in the athletic programs, and some of them were involved in what they would call in those days, I don't know whether they still do it or not, the 100-yard dash and the 440 relay. And uh, those that have watched any of those uh, athletic programs on television it looks right simple when you see those uh, fellows out there running and uh, uh, they're carrying out the 440 relay and the 100 yard dash it looks like it's quite simple but all of the training all of the uh, work and all of the strain and the stress has taken place months and months and months before they get out on the uh, track to do the race that they're involved in the athletic muscles are toned the body is ready mentally and emotionally all ready for the race and uh, yet as we watch it, it seems so simple. But we're in a race ourselves as Christians. We're in the race, and we ought to be running to win. And we need to recognize that much work needs to go into the preparation in the race. I think as Christians, we fail to recognize that we're in a race. We're watching uh, from our perspective, but not realizing how it is seen from heaven and how we are watched by those witnesses that have gone on before. The Christian life is a race. It's a contest, and we're running the race for Jesus, and that's the way it ought to be. And so how do we run the race? What do we do in running the race? How are we carrying out the race that is set before us that we need to recognize the need to run it and to run it aright if we're going to carry out the race that God has placed before us? May I remind us as we look at this text, to win the race, several things must take place. Several things, three in particular, that we'll talk about in a moment. But out of honor and recognition of the reading of the word, would you stand please as I read audibly, follow with me in your scripture silently. The book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, Verse 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of of the throne of God. Thank you, and we may be seated. I want us to notice the three things. There are three brief things that need to take place if we're going to run the race and run it to win. And may I remind us, if you're in a race, you need to run it to win. I've had the privilege down through the years of working with multitudes and multitudes of candidates as they run the race, trying to encourage them, uh, trying to point them in the direction that I believe God would have them to go in in relationship to honoring God in the office that they have chosen to run for. But as Christians, we need to recognize that we have major, major things that must take place in our lives if we're going to properly. I'm not talking about running to, sal running to find salvation. I'm not talking about running and pedaling that bicycle that we might be able to earn salvation and one day be in heaven. That's not what this text is about and not what we're talking about at all in running the race and running it to win. May I remind us there are three things we're going to notice in this text. First of all, the prerequisite for the race recorded. Secondly, the preparation for the race reviewed. And thirdly, thirdly the participation in the race revealed. Notice in verse 1, 
the earlier portion of verse 1, the prerequisite for the race recorded. Notice, first of all, we need to recognize the struggle. Recognize the struggle. Wherefore seeing, notice, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. We need to reckon, we sing many times, and we've not sung it that much lately, but there's an old song. In fact, I hope you enjoyed the oldies, as I call them, the songs that we had for our service this evening. But we fail to recognize many times as Christians as we're singing the song, Onward Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Multitudes of Christians sing that, not even realizing that we are in a battle, and that battle is that race of life racing to win in the race that we are in for the Lord Jesus Christ. May I remind us, many do not realize that we are in a race. Many do not recognize the struggle, the contest that we're in. It's the great arena called life, and we're in a race if we're saved, if we said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord, we're in that arena. Life is a struggle. It is a contest. It is that which is to be pursued each and every day as we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. The enemy tries to tear down and destroy. The enemy wants to defeat what God wants to do in your life and in mine as we run the race. Many times, many in running the way, race will not recognize the struggles that we're faced with. And so the first problem, the first difficulty, the first time there's a stumbling and falling, multitudes will sit on the sideline and watch the runners rather than being involved in the race themselves. That is simply what takes place so often in the lives of human beings today. We're in a contest, and every uh, race and every trial that we fa are faced with, we need to recognize that we're still in that race for the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, notice in the text, uses the term we and us. He's also a competitor. The Apostle Paul is not outside the realm of being a competitor. The Apostle Paul is still in the race, running that race. He is a competitor as well in the race. It is a struggle. It's not easy. It's a battle. It is a contest that we're in every day. If you don't believe that, just get out into society, and I know that I don't have to tell you this, but let me remind you, you if you're in the marketplace, the workplace, the professional field, every day, whatever you're doing, we're in a race, and that race is a battle, a struggle. We need to recognize that struggle. A number of uh, months ago, there was an article that I utilized as one of the uh, text that I did on the radio broadcast. A dear lady that was a Christian in her cubicle, and it had John 3.16 in the cubicle, and the management said she could not do that because it embarrassed and bothered others uh, in having a scripture verse. In fact, multitudes today do not recognize that in the military, they are now forbidding the military men on their dog tags for having a verse of scripture on the back of that dog tag. It is now forbidden by military. We're in the race, and in that race, there's a struggle every day in your life and in mine if we've said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. We need to recognize the struggles. Secondly, we need to remember the spectators. Remember the spectators. Notice, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about, encircled, surrounded about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Who are that, who's that cloud of witnesses? Who are those that are watching us as we're in the race? It's a wonderful study, by the way, because we look at the Scripture. God did not uh, uh, give by inspiration verse and chapter divisions. So as we look at chapter 11 and chapter 12, it's when a major unit of thought. When we look at all of Hebrews, it's one epistle, it's one letter. And yet we break it down in verse and chapter divisions. We read a verse or two and think we've really accomplished something. But chapter 11 is a couplet in relationship to chapter 12. That's the reason it says wherefore. When you see the word wherefore or therefore, you see what's gone, therefore, in the text. And as we look at this text, we recognize and realize that we need to see what has gone on before us. In a moment, we'll look at those verses in chapter 11. That's a good illustration of what I'm talking about in reading this text. May I remind us, the uh, picture here is literally of a great throng of people, a large host of witnesses to the faith and the faithfulness of every believer. We do not realize and recognize that in glory there are those that have gone on before us watching as we carry out the race. 
How are we doing in the race? What are we doing in the race? How are we accomplishing what Christ has called us to do in the race that he has placed us in? The imagery is of a great athletic arena, and it's a foot race that's taking place, and it's running toward the goal, and we're urged by that great cloud of witnesses to keep on keeping on. Don't stumble. Don't fall. Don't sit down. Don't be silent. Don't take a uh, sideline stand and say that I can't do it. I cannot run any longer. Let me read a few of those verses for us in chapter 11. And I'm just going to highlight it in chapter 11 and verse 17 and following. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, and verse 20, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob. Verse 21, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both of his sons. Verse 22, by faith, jo jo Joseph, when he, was, uh, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel. By, uh, verse 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid for three months. Verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he was come of years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh. Pharaoh's daughter. And then notice in verse 27, by faith he forsook, that is talking about to Moses, forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Verse 28, through faith he kept the Passover. By, verse 29, by faith they passed through the Red Sea. Verse 30, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down. By faith the harlot Rahab perished not, uh, not uh, with them that believed not. And then you're following, listen, and uh, Verse 32 and following, What shall I say more? For the time shall would fail for me to tell of Gideon and Barak and of Samson and of Japheth and of David also and Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of the lions, quenched the violence of the fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant the fight, turned to, turned the fight, to fight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were torn not accept in deliverance that they might be obtain a better resurrection. Verse 36, and others had trials of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, moreover of bonds and of imprisonments. Verse 37, they were stoned, they were uh, sown of slander, were uh, sunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and goatskin, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the mountains, and they all having obtained a good report through faith, receive not the promise. That is what has gone on before, and this is what the Apostle Paul, whom I believe is the human author of the book of Hebrews, as Paul writes, he is reminding those and the Hebrew Christians, reminding them, wherefore, seeing this, wherefore, understanding that these have gone on before us, they have won the race, they have run the race, and they have won the race, and we are in that race, and this is the great cloud of witnesses that's watching and witnessing what we're doing in our service and surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The witnesses, those who have gone before, those of past and those that are present. Perhaps uh, if you look at it as a relay race, a 100-yard dash in that relay race, the 440 uh, relay, as that uh, uh, runner would get to a certain point, the baton is passed on uh, to another. Is that one that goes on to glory, the baton is passed on to the next one, to the son, to the daughter, to the uh, husband, to the wife, and to the next one in the family that we might continue to run the race for Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is talking about in this text. That's what we're seeing here. Perhaps the relay race where some were already finished in their part and they had passed the baton on or they would handed it off to others and now these others are watching as we run the race for Jesus Christ today. The question is, are we running? Are we running well? How are we doing in the race that uh, uh, God has placed us in in carrying out the race as others watch the race? Keep in mind, maybe sons and daughters and mothers and fathers, uh, grandparents that are watching that's gone on to glory as we run the race. How are we running that race? Are we doing so realizing that great cloud of witnesses that is watching as we run the race? I don't know about you, but I seem minuscule as small as I analyze the great cloud of witnesses that have gone on before and how we're running the race and how they view what we're doing in relationship to our faithfulness and our commitment in carrying out that task of running the race. What about the Apostle Paul, James, Stephen, Peter watching the race? What about uh, John from the Isle of Patmos uh, uh, as he uh, had written and penned the words for the book of the Revelation of watching as we run the race? What is he seeing? What about Charles Spurgeon, G. Campbell Morgan? What about John Wesley, John Whitfield, Billy Sunday, etc., 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 that's gone on before us watching as we run the race. How are we running it? 
What are we doing in the realm of faithfulness and carrying out the task that he's called us to? As believers, we need to run the race, and we need to run the race well. But what about those friends and family members that have gone on before us? How are they witnessing and watching us as we run the race? The Apostle Paul talked about that, of wanting to run well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 and 25, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the masteries is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. Verse 26 and 27. Therefore so run not as uncertainty, so fight I not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring in it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. That word castaway comes to the root word dokimos. It's a dokimos. It means uh, rejected, refused. He says, when I run the race, I want to run in such a way that at the end of my life I will not have run in vain, that I will be run the race and will be approved in the race that I have run. We are in a race. We need to recognize the prerequisite of the race that is recorded. We need to, in that prerequisite, recognize the struggle and remember the spectators. Secondly, I want us to notice the preparation for the race reviewed. The preparation for the race reviewed. Notice in the verse 1, the latter portion, relinquish the superfluous is what I call it. Let us lay aside every weight, and it's understood every sin, every weight and every sin which does so easily beset us. Listen to the requirement in the running of the race. Listen to what the Word of God says. Runners uh, in the era of the, when the text was written in the athletic arenas of that day, it was not an unusual thing for those runners to remove every ounce of clothing that was superfluous. They would remove everything that would be a drag on their bodies to prevent them from running and running well that they might win the race. They would take their shoes off. They would run with either light shoes or no shoes. They would run with tight-fitted clothes. Some would have their heads shaved. Uh, some in their swimming uh, races that they would run, they would literally shave their bodies to prevent anything that would drag, be a drag on their bodies to prevent them from winning the races they were re running in that arena. Some athletes, according to the uh, study in the Roman arenas, would literally, in Greece in particular, would run naked so that they would not be hindered. I don't recommend that would run naked so that they'd not be hindered in running the race. This is how serious they took the race that they were in. Uh, may I remind us, in our Christian race, I need to ask the question, what hinders us from running and running well? What is it that is so easily besets us? We need to relinquish the superfluous. Let me just think for a moment on that subject. I recently had the opportunity to know of a case, it's a true story, right here in our city. A man had passed away back last October. His wife is in serious condition in a nursing home. They had a beautiful home and all of the accoutrements and all of the furnishings and everything in it. But a stranger, one that knew neither one of them well at all, put the house up for sale because it needed to be sold. Everything in the house, even the man's wallet with the few dollars that was in the wallet, was still left in the home. Everything was boxed up, placed in the garage, and was available for goodwill to pick up. All of that that they'd accumulated all of those years, everything that they had on the walls, all of the pictures, all of the little trinkets, all of the dust collectors, everything was gathered together, simply put in boxes to be disposed of because it had no value beyond this life. There are multitudes of things in your life and in my life and in the lives of Christians across the world today that's superfluous that we do not need, that is a drag, that is a hold back, that prevents us from running the race and running it to win for Jesus Christ. So the question begs to be asked and demands to be answered. What is it in your life that is superfluous, that's not needed, that you have as the goodies and the gadgets and the things that you do and the places that you go and the toys that you buy and the things that occupy your time, the things that take away from your health and the ability and the opportunities to serve Jesus Christ? What is it that needs to be relinquished that we can be in the race and win the race that Christ has called us to run? Some, it may be a job that is superfluous. There are a lot of folks today 
that are working one or two jobs simply because they want extra things. You heard the story about the man that had a three-car garage and it was so full of stuff he had to keep his car parked outside the garage. He decided that that was just not right, so he sold all the stuff to put his car back in the garage. Six months later, his garage was full of stuff, and he kept his car outside the garage again. That's the way we are as Americans today. We keep a garage full of stuff that we can't even put the car in it, and that stuff, generally speaking, will hold us back from being involved in the race that God has called us to into, into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps it's a unnecessary bills, or cars, or trucks, or jet skis, or motorbikes, etc., etc charge cards, leisure time, trips, and social events. I could go on and on and on with the infinitum list of those things that hold us back and prevent us. You'd be surprised uh, from the standpoint of a pastoral leadership role how many times I'll talk with an individual about being in church and Sunday school and worship. And many times it is a uh, story that I've heard so many times a number of years ago while on the road in full-time evangelism. Never will forget sitting in the home that the pastor had taken me into to talk with the family about coming to church. And he said, you need to We'd love to have you. The wife was a member. The husband was not. Uh, we'd love to have you to come. Revival meeting this week. And he talked about what we were doing in the church and the message that were being brought, et cetera, et cetera. And the wife said, well, you know, uh, I, I, I know that this is a revival in our church, and I'd love to come. Monday night, I just can't do it because I've got other commitments on Monday night. He said, well, how about Tuesday night? She said, well, Tuesday night is bridge with my friends, and I can't miss the bridge uh, game that we always have with the friends. How about Wednesday night? Now, he's talking to a woman that's a member of the church. How about Wednesday night? We'd love to have you in your church on Wednesday night. She said, well, I can't do it on Wednesday night. I promised my husband we'd go out to eat. Well, how about Thursday night? And it went on down. Why about th Friday night? We'd love, well, Friday's grocery day. Well, maybe I'll see you on Sunday morning. That's the mindset so often with we as believers. We're not running the race well. We're not running the race to win. We're in the race, but we're staggering on the wayside because of those superfluous things that hold us back and prevent us from being all that Christ has called us to be in our service and surrender and submission under his lordship. The apostle Paul knew something about that very clearly. In fact, in the third chapter of Philippians, we've heard this recently as we've looked at it. He said, not as though I had already attained, verse 12 of chapter uh, three in Philippians, not as though I'd already attained, uh, either were already perfect, mature, teleos, complete, but uh, I follow after that which I may apprehend to be seized, to be grasped, that which also I am apprehended or seized or grasped of Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself as to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the prize, mark of the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He was in the race to win. He was pressing for one goal. He was pressing for one thing. He had one thing in mind, one thing in his sights, one thing in his aim and ambition and aspiration, and that is to serve Jesus Christ and receive the prize at the end of the race. May I remind us that's where we ought to be in our lives today as we serve Jesus. Most of those which... Uh, we have most of those things which we hold on to, most of those worldly accomplishments and pleasures and recognition and possessions uh, where we want to climb the ladder of success, most of which are not bad in and of themselves. But the question is, do they prevent us from running the race? Do they prevent us from being all that Christ has called us to be? If we'd be honest with ourselves, everyone under the sound of my voice and beyond these walls would say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, there are things in my life that are superfluous. There are things that I don't really need that's keeping me from serving Jesus Christ. Why do you think so many churches have shut down on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights? Because the church members themselves have found too many things that they're involved in that prevent them from running the race for Jesus. Why is it we find today the apostasy of the church? Why is it we find today the numbers have gone down dramatically since 2010 in the United States of America and our churches? According to the Barna Report, since 2010, there's been approximately 50% drop-off in average Sunday worship services in the churches across all denominational lines in America. Why is that so? Because multitudes that say that they're saved, let me just give this to us clearly, most of those that say they're saved are just as lost as a green ball in high weeds. If you don't believe that's bad, ask a golfer out on tall grass on a golf course trying to bat that little ball around and find it. 
And yet multitudes today say, I'm saved. They simply are a church member. They're simply a member of the local New Testament church, but never having said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. If we're truly saved, blood-bought, Bible-saved, born again, we want to be in church. We want to study the Word. We want to meditate on the Word. We want to memorize the Scripture. We want to be under the Word as it's being proclaimed. We want to be in that race, carrying out the running of the race that pleases the Lord Jesus Christ. May I remind us there must be the relinquishment of that which is superfluous. And secondly, must remove the sin. Notice the scripture says, and the sin, and the sin which doth so easily beset us. The word beset simply means to entangle. It means to entrap. It means to derail. It means to detain. And multitudes today have sin that is their little personal, private, pet sin that they do not want to turn loose. It's hidden in the closet. It's theirs. And they take that little sin out and pet it and pamper it and let it grow and grow. And it prevents us from serving Jesus Christ as honors him. What sin do you have today that prevents you from being the very best runner for Jesus Christ? What sin is it that prevents you from running to win? Sin forms a crippling hindrance to good running. Sin forms a crippling hindrance to the running of the race. Christians are to lay aside to remove all that could hinder, all that could hurt, all that could prevent the running of the race for Jesus Christ. We're to run with perseverance, according to the text. The writer is not thinking of just a little sprint. The writer is not talk, thinking about just a 100-yard dash. The writer here is not talking about a few days or a few weeks or a few months, but he's talking about distant running, distant running. When we say yes to Jesus Christ, the race begins, and the race does not end until we hear Jesus say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And I don't know about you, but I'm running the race to see Jesus Christ face to face. I'm running the race to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'm running the race with the idea and the understanding that there's that great cloud of witnesses that's gone on before. I'm running the race and the realization that not only those names that we know in the 20, 19th, 20, and 21st century, those names that are so famous for all of us, if we've studied anything about church life and evangelism and church history, we know many of those names. I'm running the race and the realization that those great men of old that we read about in uh, 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 this text in the 11th chapter, in Hebrews chapter 11, where we find those that have gone on before us. And they're watching how we're running. Can you imagine a conversation that may be taking place with some of those that have gone on before us? Look at Gene Youngblood. Look at what he's doing. He's sitting down. He's not running. He doesn't have the zeal. He doesn't have the fervor. He doesn't have the commitment, etc., etc., etc. And that's the way our lives are being viewed by those that have run the race before us and that have gone on to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. That great cloud of witnesses are watching. We need to surrender that which is superfluous. We need to remove that which is sin that we might be able to run the race without any hindrance in the present, pres, uh, preventing us from being all that God has called us to be in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. May I remind us it requires endurance. It requires persistence. It requires keeping on, keeping on. Some will say, well, you know, I go to church Sunday if I feel like it. I go to church Sunday if I don't have anything else better to do. They don't say that verbally, but that's what they're thinking. Multitudes have that philosophy and the feeling. The race that takes a sustained effort is what we're talking about. A race that we should be uh, recognized that we're involved in, and it's a lifetime race without any, any equivocation. The distant runner, one who keeps on running with great determination over the long course of life. That would be something that the Apostle Paul is speaking of here as he points to the Hebrews Hall of Fame and what they're doing in watching as we run the race. It's the race that we are summons to run. It's a lifetime race. It's a race that we have said yes to Jesus Christ. And as the athletes in the race, we need to run the race and run it well. Not only do we see the prerequisite for the race recorded, and the preparation for the race reviewed, but I want you to notice in verse 2, the participation in the race revealed. The participation in the race revealed. If we are to run to win, there are three things that I believe we need to do in the race. Number one, we need to run 
with steadfastness. Run with steadfastness. Notice the scripture says, let us run with patience. That word patience means persistence, perseverance, endurance, steadfastness. The race that is set before us. What does that mean? How does it relate? How do we look at that in the contemporary language today? It means there's no stopping and starting. There's no sitting down and saying, well, I'm going to rest a month or two. You'd be surprised how many people I've seen say, well, preacher, you understand. Back years and years and years ago, I served as a deacon for 42 years. I was a Sunday school teacher for 19 years. I've done this, this, and this. But I've decided just to sit down and cool my jets and let the younger generation, let others then take up and keep on doing what I used to do. There's no place in the Word of God that authorizes that mindset and philosophy that, well, I've served for a long time. I can just sit down now. I don't have to run the race anymore. I don't have to set the example before us. You know the reason the multitude of those in the millennial age group, 18 to 35 years old, that's dropped out of church, you know why they've dropped out? They watch mom and dad and aunt and uncle and brother and sister and Deacon Jones and Deacon Smith and others. They watch them drop out and their philosophy is, well, they said that they love the Lord and they're not serving. They're not running the race. It must be all right. No, it's not all right at all. Run with steadfastness. No stopping, no starting and stopping. The focus must be on the race. No faint-hearted runners can enter the race. The witnesses are watching. And how are we running as they watch us run the race? What are we doing in our race for Jesus Christ? Ought not to be anything that can detain us, deter us, or dampen the spirit and the perseverance of the runner. We need to run the race regardless of what may be from the sidelines or the stand, grandstand that's booing as we run. Have you ever seen anybody that regardless of what you do for Jesus, it's a thumbs down, it's a John McCain philosophy? I could see a lot there, but I won't. It ought not to be on the basis where we listen to what others say. We ought, it ought not to be on the basis that we run if everybody's clapping and applauding. We need to run the race regardless of what the bystanders, those that are deniers of the word, those that are rejectors of the word, we ought to run the race regardless of what the sodomite lifestyle of the LGBTQ community says about the church of Jesus Christ. We ought to run the race regardless of what Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and others may say. We ought to run the race regardless of what others say about the BLM and the Antifa movement. We ought to keep on running the race and not sit down and be silent. Multitudes today, as a result of what we see happening on a national level, are saying, well, there's no point. In fact, I know a great guy here in this city. He says there's no point in witnessing, no point in spending money on evangelism and outreach. He said the whole nation is going under and there's nothing we can do. I'm just going to sit down and watch it, he said. That's a pitiful position to take for anybody that's a Christian. We need to recognize that regardless of what happens, regardless of what we see on the horizon, regardless of what we see in the White House or that will go into the White House. By the way, we've got about 80 days, 85 days to determine if we want a socialist, Marxist, dictatorship America or if we want a constitutional republic as we've had for 244 years. We've got that period of time, that threshold of time to make that choice and that decision. And if we do not act, if we do not vote, if God does not divinely intervene and put Donald J. Trump back in office, our nation is gone into a dictatorship without any equivocation. What you see in Portland, Oregon, what you see in Seattle, Washington, what you're watching across the major cities in America will be that which takes place and is on a daily basis for the norm for America in the future. Lest we realize the requirement to keep on running in the race and part of that. It's being a good citizen in the nation that we live in and to cast our ballots on election day. We need to run with steadfastness. We cannot allow anything to detain us, deter us, or dampen the spirit and the perseverance in the race. We must run with steadfastness. Secondly, we must run with singleness. Looking, notice the scripture says here, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our Notice there, the word hour, by the way, is not in the Greek text. The author and the finisher of faith. Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of faith. We can't run with divided focus. We can't run with divided goals. We can't run if our eyes are not fixed on Jesus Christ as we run the race. 
multitudes are running the Christian race, as they would call it today. The eyes are fixed on the world, fixed on the job, fixed on the profession, fixed on climbing the ladder of success, fixed on making more money, fixed on getting more things and more goodies and more toys, etc., 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 and not fixed solely on the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse 19 through verse 33, talks about food, clothing, and shelter. And it talks about the fact that Jesus has already committed to meet our food, clothing, and shelter need. And he says in the 33rd verse there that the thing is that we ought to honor him and serve him first, protos, priority, number one. But seek ye first, priority, number one, the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you. And yet so often Christians will take the attitude and the philosophy, I can't go to church, I can't study the word, I don't have time for church, I don't have time for soul winning because I've got to make a living. That is simply, there's a good Greek word for that, horse feathers. <laughs> We need to understand the need to run the race and to run the race to win. And there must be that running with steadfastness and run with singleness. Notice as we look at the text. Notice, first of all, running with singleness. G talking about Jesus, he's our confidence. Jesus, the author, that is the originator, the source, and the finisher of faith. Look what Jesus did is basically what Paul is saying in the text. Look at the Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Our faith is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his shed blood. May I remind us, Jesus is our best example of faith. He is the finisher of our faith. Look what Jesus did <clears throat> as you studied the text. Looking under Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Understand, he is our confidence. He is our completer. It is the Lord Jesus Christ that is the author and the finisher of our faith. Have you placed your faith and trust in him? If so, then what the scripture is literally saying is that he is the one that provides the faith. We look at the faith in Jesus Christ. We look at what he did. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the triunity of the Godhead. By the way, I listened to a pastor on the radio the other day that uh, is a Christian pastor. He's going to be with the Lord, but his broadcast is on the air around the globe uh, and has been for years and years and years. And... Uh, he said, uh, somebody had uh, written uh, to him asking a question. He said, in Genesis 1, 1, the Bible says that God created everything, but yet you look at Colossians, it said Jesus created everything. Who did the creation? And he went through a whole lot of diatribe, and he said, well, in heaven, uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit had a conference, and they decided that they were going to send Jesus. Jesus is going to be one that's going to leave heaven, and he's going to come to the earth, and as a result of that, it was determined that he would be the one that would be named as the creator. That doesn't wash with the Scripture. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we do not, when we get to heaven, we won't see three thrones, gigantic throne with God on it, and two subsidiary thrones, thrones with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus Christ on it. It is God the Father that made the decision that I am going in the form of man and I will die on Calvary's cross, shed my rich red royal blood that those that place their faith and trust in me might have everlasting life. And the Scripture says in Colossians 1, verse 13 through 18, that everything that's visible, everything that's invisible, everything that's in heaven, is everything that's on the earth and everything that's beneath the earth was all created by the Lord Jesus Christ. In the beginning, God created, and the God that did the creation is none other than the God Jesus Christ. In Genesis 1-1, when we see the text, understand we don't have three gods, but understand, too, as we run the race, we need to run with steadfastness. We need to run with singleness in the realization and the recognition that without faith, Jesus Christ is our only hope. He is our only uh, assurance. He's our only security. It's through Jesus Christ that this can be accomplished in our lives. And thirdly, we need to run with that security, run with security. Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He is seated in victory. His task on earth is completed. When Jesus Christ, hanging on Calvary's cross a little over 2,000 years ago, said to Telestai, it is finished. Salvation is complete. Salvation is done. My work on earth is complete and finished. May I remind us, without Jesus Christ, there would be no such thing as faith. There would be no such thing as hope. There would be no such thing as security. He is seated in victory with that victory having been completed. Therefore, we have the security in knowing that we win in the end. Did you know that? 
Did you realize that the battle's already won? We're in the daily skirmishes, yes. We're in the foxholes of life, yes. We're running the race, and sometimes we stumble and fall, but we need to get back up. One football coach on one occasion, when he was talking with another coach about a football game, and he said, man, you've got one of the players. Every time I look out there on the field, he's stumbling and falling. He said, yes, but he's a good player. So how can you say he's a good player when he keeps stumbling and falling? He said, every time he stumbles and falls, he gets back up again and stays in the game. And that's what it takes for you, and that's what it takes for me. In running the race, we might stumble, we might fall, but as we stumble and fall, we get up, and it's through our faith and trust in Jesus Christ that we win in the end. You see, in this text, we understand that Jesus saw beyond the cross. He looked beyond Calvary. Jesus died on Calvary and had victory over sin and shame so that we could run the race with security and with peace and confidence in the realization and the recognition that he gives us the victory, and it's not we ourselves. It's Jesus Christ. May it remind us Jesus won the victory for us. Our focus needs to be on Jesus. We need to follow Jesus. We need to faith Jesus in running the race. And did the Apostle Paul finish well in that race? Second Timothy, the fourth chapter, verse 6, 7, and 8. I read these verses in closing. Paul says, For I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. The Apostle Paul did not say that the Christian race is easy. He said, I fought a good fight.